All right, well, welcome to Celebration Online. As always, I just wanna say thank you so much for choosing to connect with us wherever you are watching and streaming this from. Uh, I want you to understand today that you are joining with believers from around the city, state, and world. And isn't that an awesome uh, thing to know today? I wanna encourage you, if you're watching one of our premier services, go ahead and drop in the chat where you're watching from so that we can all be encouraged today. If it's your first time here, let me be the first one to welcome you uh, to our Celebration Church online service. You can expect a great time of worship. You're going to hear an incredible, challenging word. You're going to have an opportunity to participate by giving back today to the Lord. So let me go ahead and pray for us before we begin by worshiping through song. Father, we just thank you so much um, for every single thing that you're doing in our lives, even the things that we don't realize that you're doing behind the scenes. God, I pray that you would give us just a, uh, a fresh perspective today and help us to realize that you are all ultimately in control of our lives, Father. As we come together in this way, God, we ask that you'd be honored and glorified, Father. We pray that as we worship you, um, that it would be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.
Well, we just want to echo that today at Celebration Online, and we say together, great are you, Lord. Thank you so much for joining us here at Celebration Online. My name is Pastor Stephen, and we are so thankful for the opportunity to gather together in this way. We just got finished worshiping through song. We're going to worship through a time of giving right now. And I just want to first off say thank you to those of you who continue to give here at Celebration Online. You are making this ministry and other ministries possible. People around the world in, in places that they're not able to go to church are able to hear the message and ministry of Jesus because of your faithfulness. So thank you for doing that. There's two ways you can give here at Celebration Online. The first way is by going to celebrationchurch.org and you can set up reoccurring giving there. Second way is by going to webcc.info. And here's what's amazing about webcc.info. There's so much good stuff there. I really want to encourage you to take your cell phone out. Uh, go ahead and open a new tab on your computer, webcc.info, because you can get sermon notes there. You can follow along with today's sermon. You can submit a prayer request. They got all kind of great things that you can do at webcc.info, but you can also give there. It takes less than 10 seconds to do that. Now we're in the middle of a message series about following Jesus. I'm so excited about today's message because we're going to learn what it means uh, to be a devoted follower of Christ. So why don't you go ahead, open webcc.info, open up your Bible. Let's lean into this message from Pastor Dennis Watson. Let me ask you a question. How, how would you like to be remembered throughout history? For the good things you did, not for the bad things you did. How would you like to make a difference for good and for God in the world around you? regardless of the mistakes and bad decisions you've made in times past. Today we want to learn from the Word of God, from the story of Jesus calling his first disciples, how God can take the most average, ordinary person and utilize them in extraordinary ways to make a real difference for good and for God in the world around them. Our text today is Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, or actually beginning with verse 18. You follow along as I read. The Bible says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew. And they were throwing a net into the water, for they were fishermen. They fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And so they left their nets at once, and they followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come as well. And the Bible says they immediately followed him, leaving their boat and their father behind. And in the verses that follow, we find these disciples having a front row seat to see Jesus working miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, and miracles of transformation in the lives of others. They saw incredible things because they made the decision to completely follow Jesus. Today's message is titled, Follow Jesus and Become His Disciple, because in our scripture passage, we find Jesus calling four men, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to be his first disciples. Now, the word disciple is the Holy Spirit's word, favorite word in the New Testament to describe those who were dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. It's not the word Christian, not the word believer, it's the word disciple. It's found over 250 times in the New Testament. And the word disciple means a learner or a follower, a devoted learner of someone else or a devoted follower of someone else. Now, a lot of people are professing followers of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean they're real disciples of the Lord. In John's gospel, Jesus said his real disciples are people who live by his words. His real disciples are people who love everybody else, regardless of their ethnic background, socioeconomic status, etc. He said his real disciples are people who are actively involved in producing fruit for the kingdom of God with their actions, their attitudes, and all kinds of other things as well. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus said his real disciples are committed to loving him more than anyone or anything else. They're committed to serving him sacrificially and surrendering everything to follow him him. So hearing those descriptions of a real disciple by Jesus, would you describe yourself as a disciple, as a devoted follower and learner of Jesus Christ? 
And remember, in today's scripture passage, Jesus is calling four men to be his first disciple. Again, their, their names were Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now, the unusual thing about these men is that they weren't, they weren't the elite of their society. They weren't well-known. They didn't come from well-to-do families. They didn't have a lot of possessions or money. Uh, they, they didn't have a lot of academic credits. They were simple, ordinary fishermen. They were simple men uh, who uh, fished for a living in order to provide for their families and, and to help out others as well. They were common laborers in their day. While they had probably received some kind of education from their Jewish upbringing, they weren't, uh, they weren't really educated like the religious elite of that day. And they certainly didn't have a lot of money or a lot of possessions and those kinds of things. They were simple, ordinary, average people. And by the way, they were also sinful people. In Luke's gospel, which we, when is recounting this story of Jesus calling his first disciples, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, I'm too sinful to be hanging out with you or spending time with you. Now, here's what I want you to understand from this passage of Scripture. Again, no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've had or what you haven't had, no matter what bad decisions you made before in your life, uh, no matter what, uh, Jesus can use you like he used these four men to make a difference for good and for God in the world around us. But here's the key. They were dedicated to following Jesus. They were dedicated to following Jesus. Mark's gospel says in Mark 8, 34, uh, calling the crowd to join his disciples, Jesus said, if any of you wants to be my follower, my disciple, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and follow me. And these four men and others as well were willing to become those kind of followers of Jesus those kind of disciples of Jesus. And God used them in such extraordinary ways that even today, 2,000 years later, we still remember their names and what God did in, for, and through their lives. So here's the thing I want you to know. There's a big difference between the crowds that follow Jesus and the men and women and teenagers who are real, devoted disciples of Jesus. So what does it take to follow Jesus and be his disciple in 2022 Three things I want you to really focus in on today. To begin with, following Jesus and being his disciple requires getting involved in fishing for people. How do I know that? Because that's what Jesus himself said in our scripture passage today. Jesus called out to them in verse, four, verse 19. He called out to these fishermen and said, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Now, some of you who are viewing our service today probably have been fishing at times in your life. And some of you may even be good fishermen. You may be adept at catching fish. Me, I, I'm not a good fisherman. In fact, when I go, it seems like the conspiracy in the sea, have a, have, it seems like the fish have made a conspiracy to not get caught on that day. Now, that's a good thing to know how to catch fish. But it's an even better thing to know how to fish for people and catch people. What does it mean to fish for people? Fishing for people involves using our time, our abilities, and our resources to connect people to Jesus, to, to bring them into his church family, and to help them grow in their faith. And, and, and Jesus said here, and other Bible passages say as well, that real disciples of Jesus, real followers of Jesus, are constantly involved in fishing for people. So what are some ways that we can be involved in fishing for people? Well, we're fishing for people when we serve others through our church. You know, the Bible tells us that God's called all of us to be involved in serving him with our time and our talents and our abilities. And the way we serve him is by serving other people. One time, some of Jesus' disciples wanted to be the big shots in the group. Have you ever met people who just wanted to be the big shots? They wanted to be preeminent and prominent above everyone else. But Jesus said, don't be like the world and the leaders in the world who flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it must be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And throughout the New Testament. We find Jesus and Paul and Peter and others telling us how important it is for all of Jesus' followers to be involved in serving God by serving others. In fact, we should be regularly looking for ways we can help and serve others because we care about them and because we want to show the love of Christ to them. But also we should be involved in serving others because we want to connect them to Jesus. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about that. He said in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, I have become a servant of everyone. That's what all of us need to be doing. He said, I've become a servant of everyone so that I can bring them to Christ. Paul said, I'm involved in serving others because I care about others, because I want to help others. But my primary motivation is to connect 
people to Jesus Christ, to bring them to a relationship with the Lord. Now, listen, I'm grateful for all the people that we have serving God here at Celebration Church and serving people here at Celebration Church. I'm especially grateful for those who are involved in serving in the children's ministry and in the midpoint ministry and in our youth ministry. I'm grateful for those who serve in our worship ministry. And I'm grateful for those who serve as life group leaders and those who help welcome us, welcome people to our church service. I'm grateful for those who help produce and put together our online service here today. And let me tell you, those people are doing what they're doing. They're investing their time and ability because they love people. They love God and they care about people but also because they want to connect people to Jesus Christ. They want people to experience the transforming power of Jesus Christ in their lives. And and you and I, we need to be involved in serving people in that kind of way. In fact, ask yourself this question. What are some ways I could be involved in serving people in the church or the world so I could show them Christian love and connect them to the Lord? We're also fishing for people when we share Jesus with others. Now, while it's good to care for and serve others, they'll not spend eternity in heaven with the Lord or with us, unless they receive Jesus as the Savior and Lord of their lives. Several days ago, the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, recently sat down with a Christian organization called the Babylon Bee. The Babylon Bee is best known for its tongue-in-cheek humor and commentary on the Christian church and Christian faith, and more recently, even political controversy. When the Babylon Bee discovered that Elon Musk was following them on Twitter, they decided to ask for the seemingly impossible. Much to the Babylon Bee shock and and delight, Musk agreed to an interview with them on the condition that they would come to him. And so they did. And in the interview, the famous billionaire talked about space travel and woke culture and electric cars and all kinds of things. But then unexpectedly, in the midst of that conversation, The Babylon Bee's creative director, Ethan Nicole, asked Elon Musk if he would like to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. The question obviously caught Musk off guard. He pondered the question, talking about his respect for and agreement with many of the principles of Christianity that marked the life of Christ, including turning the other cheek. And then he said, Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. He was quoting Albert Einstein, who is said to believe that he said, who said, to, who said one time, "I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals Himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns Himself with the fates and actions of human beings." But Scriptures tell us that God is intimately involved in the lives and circumstances of human beings, that God has a unique plan and purpose for our lives, that not, God's not just sitting out there on the rim of space, uninvolved, unconcerned with his creation, but that God cares about every single one of us. Well, expounding on his response, Musk explained the importance of forgiveness, treating others as you want to be treated, and loving your neighbors, you love yourself. And he said, if Jesus is saving people, I won't stand in his way. Well, I've got news for Elon Musk and for everybody out there, everybody else out there in the world. Jesus is still saving people. He's still changing lives. And everybody from the wealthiest to the poorest people on the planet, everybody needs to experience his saving power if they want to make it to heaven. When I think about that story, I think of how we need to be as bold as Ethan Nicole was in his conversation with Elon Musk. We need to be bold enough to challenge the people around us to receive Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of their lives. Paul said these words. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, God gave gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly, even though we were surrounded by many who opposed us. And may you and I have that kind of courage and boldness to tell the people around us about who Jesus is to us, what he's done for us, and what he can do for them as well. How do we do that? We can share the good news about Jesus with people by sharing our faith stories with them by giving them Christian materials or directing them to Christian websites, by inviting them to church services or life groups. But here's the thing. We've got to be involved in these kind of activities if we want to be a real disciple of Jesus Christ. If we're not out fishing for people by telling people about Jesus, then we're really not following Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And then we're fishing for people when we disciple others. It's important to be involved in serving and helping others. It's important to be involved in sharing our faith with others. But it's also important to be involved in helping people who are new Christians to grow in their faith and their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. What that means is that when a person comes to faith in Christ, we're to be investing time in them. Share with them what we've learned from the Lord. Share with them what we've learned from the Word of God. 
of God, taking them alongside of us and, and helping them from infancy to through adolescence to maturity in the Christian life. We disciple others by spending time with them, by modeling real Christianity to them, by sharing with them what we've learned and doing what we can to help them grow in their faith and relationship with the Lord. In fact, you ought to be thinking about uh, this question. Who are some people that I could be deciphering right now in the world around me? It may be your children. maybe your grandchildren. It may be somebody you work, uh, that you work with. It may be a neighbor. It may be somebody you've been friends with for a long time. Uh, but every single one of us ought to have people in our lives that we are discipling, helping them to grow stronger in their relationship with the Lord. We're fishing for people. When we serve others through our church, we're fishing for people when we share our faith with others, and we're fishing for people when we disciple others. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my followers, you're going to have to be involved in fishing for people. But also following Jesus and being a disciple involves responding immediately and completely to the Lord. Let's go back to our story, Matthew 4. The Bible says Jesus called out to Peter and Andrew, come follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And the Bible says they left their nets at once, and they followed him. Now, several things I want to point out here quickly. Number one, to follow Jesus, you've got to be able to hear from the Lord. And we talked about that in recent weeks, how we hear from God as we study his word, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, spend time with mature Christians. And sometimes God speaks to us through dreams and visions and angels and other ways as well. To respond to the Lord, we've got to first hear from him. And Jesus said we ought to be hearing from him. He said in John 27, uh, 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. But also to respond to the Lord, we have to be willing to obey him. Look back in our text. When Andrew and Peter heard Jesus calling them to leave what they were doing and join in fishing for people, the Bible says they left their nets at once and they followed him. They didn't argue or disagree with the Lord. They didn't say this is not a good time for us. Uh, They didn't make up excuses as to why they couldn't do that. They didn't say we have a better way. They simply obeyed the Lord. And that's one of the keys to being a real disciple of Jesus. We must be willing to live a life of obedience every day of our lives. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 8, 31, real disciples follow his instructions in their decisions and in their lives. So let me ask you, how are you doing when it comes to obeying the Lord? How obedient to the Lord are you in your prayer life or in your Bible reading? How obedient to the Lord are you are, are you in your worship attendance? How obedient to the Lord are you in your giving or in the way that you live? How obedient to the Lord are you in your dating life or your married life or, or when you're on the Internet? Uh, how obedient are you to the Lord in every aspect of your life? The Christian life is to be a life of obedience, and the Bible says the Lord blesses those who are committed to obeying him. Not only were James and John willing to obey the Lord, not only were Peter and Andrew willing to obey the Lord, but James and John were also willing to obey the Lord. It says in verses 21 and 22, a little farther up the shore, Jesus saw two other brothers, James and John, repairing their nets. He called for them to come as well, and they immediately followed him, leaving their boat and their father behind. Now, James and John were like Peter and Andrew, not only obeying the Lord, but notice both, both groups of brothers obeyed the Lord right away, immediately. And that's often the problem that many Christians struggle with. They want to obey the Lord in their lives. They plan to obey the Lord in their lives, but they never get around to fully obeying the Lord in their life because of procrastination or because of perfectionism in their life. You know, a lot of Christians probably struggle with procrastination. Maybe you're a procrastinator. You know somebody who is a procrastinator who are always putting off things and never get to the things that they're putting off. I've been told there's a procrastinators club in America that claims to have over 350,000 members, but only 33,000 have taken the time to send in their application and be a member. People struggle and miss out on all kinds of opportunities because of procrastination. And then there's perfectionism. Uh, Perfectionists say, I'm going to wait until everything's perfect. Uh, then I'll start serving God. I'm going to wait till my kids grow up. I'm going to wait till I get financial security. I'm going to wait till things are going great in my life. I'm going to wait till I get out of school. I'm going to wait till I get married. I'm going to wait till I get rid of these bad habits in my life. Listen, real disciples do what they can with what they have, not tomorrow, but today. They, they don't wait. They don't make excuses. They obey the Lord and obey him now. They don't wait for perfection or for the perfect time. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11.4, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Notice this also. These first disciples left their vocations to follow Jesus. Uh, They not only obeyed him right away, but they left their vocations to follow Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you to quit your job unless 
The Lord tells you to quit your job. I've read testimonies in recent weeks about a male porn star and a female porn star who left their vocations. If you're in a godly vocation, you need to lose that and leave that kind of vocation. They left their vocations and now have become ministers for the Lord. But I'm not telling you to leave your job. But these first disciples left their vocation to follow Jesus, which reminds us we always have to give up some aspect of our lives to follow the Lord. Now, that's not how we prefer to do things. We don't want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, but we want to hang on to some things or some people in our lives. We want to hang on to some of our so-called friends who keep pulling us away from the Lord rather than us helping us in our relationship with the Lord. We want to hang on to some of those habits that really hurt our relationship with the Lord, not help our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we want to hang on to our money and possessions and not be faithful and generous givers to the work of the Lord. Uh, we sometimes want to hang on to certain profanities or priorities or pleasures in our lives that have characterized our life before we committed our life to Jesus Christ. But listen to the words of Jesus in Mark 8.35. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Jesus' words in Mark 8 remind us that the call to follow Jesus is a call to surrender everything to be his disciple. And by the way, if what Jesus offers us is really true, it deserves everything that we have. And if it's not true, then we need to go find something else in our lives. C.S. Lewis said the only thing that Christianity cannot be is moderately important to us in our lives. It's got to mean everything to us in our lives. C.T. Studd was a British athlete and entrepreneur, very famous in his day, and he gave up everything to become a missionary for the Lord. And somebody asked him how he could give up everything to follow Jesus Christ and be a missionary for the Lord. Here's what he said. If Jesus Christ is God and he died for me, there's not anything I should not be willing to do for him. And it, since Jesus Christ is God, we've got to be willing to give up everything to follow him. He wants us to give 100% of our life to him. So we got to be careful not to allow work or play or sports or hobbies or friends or school or dating or pleasure or making money or having possessions or even our family to keep Jesus out of first place in our lives. Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 14 about an influential person who plans a great banquet. And she sends a servant out to invite people to come to the wonderful banquet. And the servant says that, the people began to make excuses. The first man said, I've just bought a field. And I must go and see it. Please excuse me. The second guy said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go test them out. Please excuse me. The third guy said, I've just gotten married, so I can't come. Please excuse me. Now think about these, this. These guys are invited to a great banquet by a great host, and yet they all turn him down. The first guy uses his wealth as an excuse. The second guy uses his work as an excuse. The third guy uses his wife as an excuse. Sounds like she's already in charge in his life. But let me ask you this question. What excuses do you keep giving God for not fully obeying him in your life? Whatever those excuses are, they're keeping you from following Jesus uh, the way he's called you to follow him and, and being the disciple he's called you to be and being the difference maker he's called you to be. We all know uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, but let me just tell it to you in the Living Bible prayer phrase, and everything you do, it says, put God first, and he will direct and crown your efforts with success. So following Jesus and being his disciple requires getting involved in fishing for men. It requires responding immediately and completely to the Lord. And then following Jesus and being his disciple requires sharing life with other believers. In our story, you find Peter, James, Andrew, and John responding to Jesus' call to be his first disciple. But understand this. They weren't committing to follow him individually, but to follow him collectively, not only with the, the four of them, but also with others as well. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, we're told about the other disciples who became a part of that closest group to Jesus. Among them were Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John, but there was also Philip, and Bartholomew, and Thomas, and Matthew, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and even Judas Iscariot himself. And here's what that tells us. The life of a follower of Jesus or disciple of Jesus is not just an individualistic life. We just, it's just us and Jesus. It's to be the kind of life that is shared with other people, that is enjoyed with other people, and sometimes that is even endured with other people. So how are we to share our lives with other people if we're going to be real disciples and followers of Jesus. Well, to begin with, disciples of Jesus share their knowledge and experience with other people. It says in Proverbs 27, 17, is iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And you see, the Bible says we learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's wise to learn from experience? Let me tell you, it's even wiser to learn from the experiences of others. Now, there are things you don't know. 
that I could benefit from. There are things I know that you could benefit from. We don't have enough time to learn everything on our own and make all the mistakes on our own. And so we need to share our knowledge and experiences with other people. That involves spending time with other people, communicating with other people. Also, disciples of Jesus share their problems with other people. Now, you've heard me say before, everybody has a problem or is a problem or lives with a problem. But oftentimes, the biggest problem with our problems is we won't talk about our problems. We won't ask people to pray with us about our problems. We won't share with others about our problems. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, 2, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Disciples of Jesus also share their abilities with others. The Bible says God's given us all abilities, and we're to utilize those abilities to encourage others in our lives. And in turn, we're to let them use their abilities to encourage us in our lives. And then disciples of Jesus share their resources with others. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers of that day were united in heart and mind, and they felt what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Now, here's what I'm saying. You can't be a real disciple of Jesus like Peter and Andrew and James and John and the other disciples were until you are intentionally involved in sharing your life, your experiences, your problems, your abilities, and even your resources with others. You may call yourself a disciple of Jesus, but you're not really one if you're never involved in sharing your life with other Christians. And by the way, that's why we encourage people here at Celebration Church to get involved in life groups and, so they can share their lives. And Pastor Stephen's going to tell you about how you can get connected to an online life, life group in the future. And also, by the way, other Christians that we surround ourselves with, they're the ones who help us stay focused and stay strong when the problems and problem people of life come our way. In fact, Jesus' is first disciples probably wouldn't have made it. They would have been failures, abject failures. We wouldn't know about them today if they hadn't shared their lives and forged such great bonds with other believers. One of our seminary professors once said, there are no successful Lone Ranger Christians. Now, if you're a parent, you know one of the first lessons we parents have to teach our children is how to share. One time a mother had baked some brownies for her children, and, and they digested them over a couple of days. And then the day came, there's only one big brownie left on the platter. And she came into the kitchen and saw her oldest son with a hand on that brownie. And wanting to teach him a spiritual lesson, she asked the question, what would Jesus do with that last brownie? Well, he had been brought up in church, and he knew the stories of the Bible. He said, i tell you, Mama, what Jesus would do. Jesus would multiply this brownie into 5,000 more so everybody could have all the brownies they want. Maybe Jesus would, but here's what, I, here's what I know he wants. He wants us to share our lives with other people, to share our lives with other believers. I need to be doing that. You need to be doing that. So ask yourself, what are some steps I need to take to get involved in a small group, to get involved in a church family so that I can develop this circle of friends around me who are praying for me and encouraging me, and I'm praying for them and encouraging them so I can be a real disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, at the end of today's chapter, here's what we find. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 24, news about Jesus spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, whatever their problem, he healed them all. Now, I wish I'd have been there on that day. Maybe you wish you'd have been there when Jesus was doing all that healing, freeing work, but here's the thing. These four disciples were there. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they were there because they committed to following Jesus. They committed to fishing for people. They committed to obeying the Lord. They committed to sharing their lives with other people. And here's what I'm telling you. If you will get on board with Jesus today, if you'll become a real disciple of Jesus, if you'll answer the call and become one of his committed followers, if you'll get involved in fishing for people and living obediently and sharing your life with other Christians, you will get a front row seat to see the amazing things that Jesus Christ will do, not only in your life, but in the lives of many others in the world around you. Don't miss the opportunity to be a real disciple. And don't miss the adventure of being a real disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the most profound pastors and preachers I ever heard was a man by the name of Stephen Olford. I met him years ago. Stephen Olford uh, uh, wasn't always a pastor. He actually grew up in a missionary family in Africa. But then he went away to school and to college in England. And while he was there, he got involved in all kinds of things that neither the Lord nor his family would have approved of. He was a young man trying to make his way in life, wanted to be successful in all kinds of ways. And and then one day he was stricken with a critical illness. In fact, he was told as he was in the hospital that he only had a few days to live. 
while he's in the hospital, he received a letter from his father who was still in Africa. Now, back in those days, it took took weeks, maybe months for letters to get from Africa to Europe. And uh, he didn't know when his father had written the letter. But as he opened the letter, here's what the letter said. I'm summarizing the letter. His father said, Stephen, I just sense you haven't been living for the Lord. Let me remind you, all of life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And reading those words, Stephen Olford pushed himself to the side of his hospital bed, and he fell on the floor, and he fell on his knees, and he prayed these words to the Lord. Lord, anytime, anywhere, any place, I belong to you. I give you all of my life. And three days later, he walked out of that hospital, a healed man, to become a powerful preacher of the gospel. Here's what I'm telling you. If you will go all in with Jesus Christ, like Peter and Andrew did, like James and John did, if you'll go all in with the Lord, then God will do mighty and miraculous things in your life and for your life and through your life. That will amaze you and amaze others. And you will make a great difference for good and for God in the world around you. Now, I want you to bow your head right now with me. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask you this question. What excuse have you been using? What excuse have you been using to not become a devout, devoted follower of Jesus? What excuse have you been using for not going all in with the Lord? Think about that. Know this, that whatever excuse that may be, whatever excuse that may be, It's keeping you from being everything God's called you to be. It's keeping you from living like God's called you to live. It's keeping you from doing what God's called you to do. It's keeping you from having the impact God wants you to make. And just like these four men who were nobodies, they were nobodies. They made all kinds of mistakes, and they had all kinds of issues and problems. God, Just like God used them, he can use you if you'll go all in with the Lord today. Now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. For some people, going all in with the Lord is praying to receive Jesus as their Savior. For some people, going all in with the Lord is rededicating their life to Him. For some people, going all in with the Lord is saying, Lord, I want you to help me get rid of this bad habit in my life. For some people, going all in with the Lord is getting connected to a church family and finding out how you can be involved in serving in your church. You ask God to show you, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray with me right now about going all in with the Lord, like Peter and Andrew, James and John did. Pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And today, I want you to be the Lord and the Master and the King of my life. I want to be your devoted disciple. I want to be a follower of you like Peter and Andrew, James and John were. I want you to work in my life and for my life and through my life like you did in their lives as well. And I pray this today with all of my heart in the name of Jesus. There was so many good things um, that we just heard in that message. One of the things that stood out was something that Pastor Dennis said at the beginning. He said, it doesn't matter what you've done, you can still follow Jesus. And I love that. The message to follow Jesus is for everyone. That means you as well. If you pray with Pastor Dennis today to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, to be a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus, let us know about that decision. Click on the Make a Decision tab at webcc. Dot info. Pastor Dennis also said the message today that there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian, and we believe that with everything within us here at Celebration Church. If it's your first time here, you're going to learn really quickly that we are all about community here at Celebration. And I want to let you know that it doesn't matter where you're watching, where you're streaming from, you can still be connected to what God is doing, and you can still find community here at Celebration Online. At all of our campuses this weekend here in Southeast Louisiana, we're having our Life Group Connection event, which means this is an opportunity for people to find connection in their community and to be able to connect with other believers. I want to, you know, if you're watching this online, that we have people who are leading life groups online. And so just because you're not close to a physical campus is not an excuse to not be connected to the body of Christ. So go to webcc.info, click on the make a decision tab and click on, I want to get connected to a life group so that we can connect with you and help you to find what's the best way for you to follow Jesus in the context of community. Man, I love walking through a book of the Bible. This study has been incredible. I love doing this in my own personal time and doing this as a church. I want to encourage you to stick with us in the coming days. God is going to do incredible things, not just here at Celebration Online, but in your personal life as well. Have a blessed week. I'll see you next week here at Celebration Online.